In the last few weeks, couple of months even, a great number of friends, acquaintances and friends of friends have lost their lives unexpectedly, with the great majority of those deaths coming from some kind of heart condition or failure. I was really puzzled because many of them appeared healthy, fit even, having run races and triathlons, which made their passing an untimely, very shocking and highly unexpected event. I was, really, I was really puzzled as to the reasons why, so I decided to see if I could kind of like find out what was going on. And so in that regard, I decided to seek out an old family friend of mine from back home in Penang. He's a highly respected heart doctor who has been seeing heart patients for nearly 40 years to see if he could help shed any light on what was going on. And since, because we are family friends from back home in Penang, I call him Imbum. But to the rest of the world, his name is Dr. Surin Thuresingam. He's a consultant cardiologist at CVSKL in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. It's a specialist hospital which you know, specializes in cardiac and vascular diseases. And uh, so he very kindly agreed to come on and help discuss the hows and the whys and the wherefores of heart conditions and failures. And much of his wisdom was surprising, shocking even. And it was of course very instructive and very useful to someone in my situation as well as people of my age as I'm sure it will be to you too as well. And so, as always, if you do find the people that I speak to on this podcast uh, and the content interesting, useful, please do um, subscribe to the channel, uh, give me a like, uh, share, share the content among your friends and networks. And of course, if you want to, please leave me some comments uh, in, in the comment box below. And so, dear viewers, without further ado, may I present Dr. Surin Tresingham. So, Imbam, um, I think my first question to you is... Um, yes, Tom. Why are so many you know, seemingly healthy people just dropping dead um, from heart disease? You make it sound as though that it's something recent or something new that's going on, but it's been happening all the time. Uh, it's just that we're getting to the age where we have friends and, and people who we associate with from our from my age group who are, who are dying. So lots of people do die from heart disease and it's uh, the biggest killer not only here but worldwide and um, <clears throat> it happens because number one the genetics of these people are probably bad and they have less than ideal lifestyles and most importantly they have not basically done any tests or checkups on themselves and what's most uh, worrying is that they may have done these tests and not taken uh, taken note of the advice they were given by whoever has done those tests on them so I, I don't think it's more common um, uh, and I think it's just that we are now at the age where we know people who, who, who died but well, that's the thing. Um, we are reading reports that, you know, uh, quite young people, 15, 16, athletes, 20 something, seemingly fit people are, you know, falling prey to the, to the disease. Is it, does it, it seems to be more common than ever before. I mean, if you refer to that age group, teenagers, uh, people in their 20s or early 30s who, who have sudden expect, unexpected cardiac death, it's usually not due to the one, the kind of thing that clobbers people of my age and your age, uh, which is coronary artery disease. These are most likely to be un previously undiagnosed congenital heart abnormalities, uh, like um, I won't go into fancy names and stuff, but there are lots of things that are inherited from parents. Uh, <clears throat> and the commonest killer of so-called healthy people without coronary artery disease is viral illnesses. Um, COVID was obviously the big bad boy in the hood for over the last five years. Uh, but any viral uh, infection can damage the heart. And I've seen countless young people drop dead from 
myocarditis. Myocarditis is infection or inflammation of the heart muscle due to, usually due to viral infection. And that can strike anyone. And that's why we always say if, you're, if you've got a flu or a fever, don't exercise because you, you may have a silent low-grade myocarditis which can kill you. Um, so those deaths you, you uh, refer to are not due to coronary artery disease, which is the number one killer which we're talking about, heart attack. Uh, so, yeah. If you're talking about the age group 30, 40, 50, yes, that is usually, uh, well, that is more into the, the zone of coronary artery disease, which is, again, uh, a disease that is largely inherited, the, or the predisposition to it is largely inherited. And I would say that 70 to 80 percent of people who have premature heart disease have a genetic predisposition to it. So how much has um, hered being, being hereditarily inherited of that illness, can, can a ratio be a portion to it, like maybe 30 percent or 20 percent, which is out of the control essentially? That's an excellent question actually. That, that really hits the nail on the head. If I was to see 100 patients who come in um, with you know chest pain or symptoms of breathlessness or something and they're worried about it the first question the most pertinent question i can ask them which will make me mm, is whether they've their parents had had premature heart disease what, what we do we mean by premature heart disease therefore a dad who has a, a angioplasty or bypass or heart attack below the age of 55 or a mum below 65. if any of those things are mentioned it just sends sets of alarm bells because we really need to investigate these people and make sure that they don't have any any features that might allude to the fact they have this predisposition in them genetically. So that's the number one risk factor. I mean, um, I would say that 80, 70 percent of patients who present with uh, young people or people under the age of say 60 with heart disease that's all, normally the overriding uh, common factor they all have. So if you have a mom or dad who's had a heart attack or uh, angioplasty or a bypass um, in that age group, then you, you just better go and do a checkup, check your bloods, make sure your blood pressure is good, make sure your cholesterol is good, all those risk factors which I'm sure we'll go into, and make sure you don't smoke them. Okay, before we get into the, any of the um, things we shouldn't do, um, you know, obviously, you know, you and I go back a long way. Yep. And uh, we've had a few of our mutual friends, yep. you know, uh, leave us the, in the last, in fact, even in the last few months. Yep. Um, in those conditions, do you think that they are pre existing issues? I mean, I would say that most of the deaths, sudden deaths in people above the age of 40, it's due to good old fashioned coronary artery disease which is atherosclerosis and all those things which we've been talking about and um, there seems to be a pattern to the nature of the hereditary heart disease some people inherit this problem of blockages of the heart but you know they go on till they're 60 or something then they get angina and then they go into a checkup and they find all these multiple chronic ugly calcified blockages everywhere and they usually end up with a bypass or angio multiple angioplasties but there's some others who have a hereditary uh, predisp uh, predisposition to a disease that manifests with sudden death or massive heart attacks at early age there we, we still haven't we are unable to detect those genes at this moment in time but we do clearly see a pattern of coronary artery disease uh, which is hereditary and um, <clears throat> these people we are talking about here they probably suffered from premature coronary artery disease and uh, many of them had family history of heart disease as well. So 20, 30, 40 percent, what's the ratio that you can kind of anecdotally say? Uh, family history yeah. as, the cause, as the main culprit behind it, I would say 70 percent. Okay, but in terms of the portion of your outcome that you cannot control. Um, that, yeah, again, excellent. What, how much can you control? That, so, I, if I can just break it down again. The things we can control 
um, through lifestyle and diet and exercise. I would say in the case of coronary artery disease, 30, 40% maybe, you can determine 30, 40% of that health component through your own efforts. The rest, the 60, 70%, no matter if you do all the right things, you, you eat healthy, you exercise, you keep your weight down, you do all the things that you're, we are told to do day in, day out in all the, you know, in the nutrition uh, advice pages and, and the media. You can only control up to 30 or 40 percent of your cardiovascular health. If you have bad family history uh, and you have high blood pressure and diabetes and cholesterol, you will need drugs. And thank God for drugs because without drugs, we'd be seeing many, many, many more people dying. I'll go so far as to say if everybody took drugs, even those who are so-called borderline or mildly afflicted by any of these conditions, if they all went on drugs early, uh, we'd probably have half the volume or less than half the volume of work we currently have to deal with. Okay, so, so before we get into the drug aspect, mm. when you say that 40% is really in control and 60% is not, I have it actually the other way around, that you can control 60-70%. And so it's not the case. Oh, I see countless people who come into my clinic for checkup. They are young, they're, well, they're in their 40s, 50s. They are, you know, they're, they're sensible, they're hardworking, they're intelligent. You know, they look after their health, they exercise, they all belong to gyms, they look fabulous. They look like, you know, advert specimens. Uh, and they don't smoke, they don't drink, they, they you know, they live immaculate, health conscious lives. But when I find out that their dad had a heart attack at 55, I say, listen, you better go and do this, this, this. No, but doc, I'm not like my dad. My dad was a smoker. My dad was overweight. I say, sorry, mate, or sorry, madam, you better go and do these checks because I am concerned because you have a family history. I've had four or five Buddhist monks who have had heart attacks at, in their 40s and 50s. So, you know, I mean, Buddhist monks that don't smoke, don't drink. Don't drink, don't drink. They're generally quite, well, they're not usually big overweight guys. Uh, so, there you go. So, <clears throat> these super healthy people, and to look at their faces after they come and get their results that they've got a block or they've got severe plaques everywhere and they need to be on lifelong medication. But I said, no, doctor, cannot be, I cannot be. I am so healthy, you know, I'm never, I said, I'm so sorry, you've inherited this. But I can give you a way out, which is confine, you know, subject you to taking medication lifelong, which will virtually guarantee your good health uh, till you're old. So what kind of stuff are you, I mean, can you recommend? Well, I mean, it depends. The, the five big risk factors for heart disease, okay? This is you know, what I've been doing for the last 30 years. Somebody walks through the door, they say, I have pain here, I've got itchy poking pain here, pain here. Or I read Google and it says, if you see a left side, it's your heart. Um, and I said, okay, hold on. All right, yeah, you got pain. Yeah, let me, let me hear more about that. But first of all, do your parents have heart disease? Uh, no, my parents have no heart disease. I said, great. Do you have high blood pressure? No. Diabetes? No. Do you have high cholesterol? No. Do you smoke? No. So immediately that person is comes down way down on the wrist I say ah, I can you know I can chill this pain is likely to be muscular or something else but if a patient comes and he has this funny funny pain that doesn't sound anything like heart I'm sure we're going to the symptoms of heart disease shortly or later even if he doesn't have any symptoms that vaguely suggests he's got a heart problem if he's got a high blood pressure, he's got diabetes or borderline diabetes, he's got cholesterol, his parents have heart disease prematurely and he's a smoker. He's like, ee, ee, ee. he's high risk and no matter what, he, you, you owe it to him to at least work him up to a certain extent to make sure that he's not got silent heart disease. Uh, or at least guide him in the direction that will prevent him from succumbing in the years ahead. So you mentioned some methods that can be deployed. What are some of them? Well, I mean, as I said, okay, the five major risk factors, everybody's listening to this. Look at yourself in the mirror. Look, look at your mom and dad. Do they have premature heart disease? Or well, you can't do anything about your mom and dad, except go and get a checkup once you hit 30 plus to make sure you don't have any of their features that will predispose you. 
If you've got high blood pressure, go and see a doctor, get it verified and start treatment. So blood pressure treatment, number one. If your cholesterol is anything above perfect, with family history, you start a statin drug uh, from the day you know and until you're ready to meet your maker. And the statin drug will reduce your risk of events by 70 to 80 percent. If you smoke, please quit. If you have diabetes, get that under control. But if you're diabetic, the, the funny thing about diabetes is once you get top diabetes, therefore you've got the blood features, your HbA1c test is high, or your glucose tolerance test suggests you have diabetes, then um, despite keeping perfect control of your sugar, your risk of heart disease goes up threefold. So being diabetic is like a turbocharger for everything else to go wrong. Uh, though your sugar itself may be very well controlled, the state of being diabetes is a major, you know, major blanket of doom. So you should uh, address all the other risk, fact risk factors very aggressively. How does one prevent one from getting diabetic? Again, if I put it in this, uh, this analogy that if your seed for diabetes is strong, and for mom and dad both had diabetes young, you inherited the seed again. Everything is inherited, right? You plant the seed, but you, the soil is parched. You don't, you're not obese, you eat sensibly, you exercise, you do all those healthy things that we all know about. Then it's possible that that seed will never germinate and come to fruition. So you, if your seed is weak, you inherited a weak gene, therefore parents only develop diabetes in their 70s or 80s then you might get away with diabetes, not getting diabetes. But if both parents have diabetes at early age, you can be, you know, avoid carbohydrate, avoid sugar, exercise like crazy, but you'll probably get diabetes. So, by corollary, if you don't have inherited diabetes, then you exercise, you eat properly, don't Yeah, you'll sugar, avoid it, yeah. Exercise, yeah. 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 So, what are some of the symptoms of, you know, uh, an, a pending heart issue? Okay, now this brings me on to the, the most difficult thing. It's very hard to, to describe this without pictures and, and diagrams, but I'll try and do my best. The symptoms of heart disease arise when you have a significant blockage in one of the three major arteries of the heart. The heart is this muscle thing that's pumping you there. The first three sources of blood to the heart, uh, the, f the sources of blood that supply the heart to do its work are the first branches that come off the main pipe called the aorta. So these pipes go and they feed the heart uh, blood. Now if you develop a narrowing in any one of these arteries, a severe narrowing, therefore something more than 70%, then the area that is supplied by that particular artery will experience a, de a deficiency of blood supply, especially during physical exertion. So if you're running up a hill and you start getting tight, central chest tight feeling, can't breathe, jaw tightness, then you stop, think, wow, what's going on here? And it goes away. That is a sign of ischemia of the heart. Ischemia is deficiency of blood supply. So when you have ischemic heart disease, therefore a heart that is being deprived of blood supply and hence oxygen, which is carried in the blood. So if you have that symptom, you run up when you're doing physical workout or something, you have tightness, breathlessness, that is a symptom of a severe narrowing. But the paradox is, the severe narrowing, 70-80%, which usually build up over time, rarely cause a heart attack. The things that cause heart attack are usually plaques that are only 40-50%. or So they have not reached a stage where they're impairing the blood flow and causing ischemia, such that you get symptoms. That's why most of the people who have these sudden death episodes, heart attacks, have had no warning. So, this is the biggest challenge we have in coronary artery disease management. If you have chest pain or breathlessness, you, and you go and see a doctor and you have, he calls it angina. Angina is the, that symptom which I described, which arises from uh, insufficient blood supply. If you have angina, you, the test will eventually um, expose the fact you have a severe narrowing. 
and that can be dealt with by a balloon or angioplasty or stent uh, is what we do as interventional cardiologists or if there are multiple blocks in many arteries you end up having a bypass whichever the cardiologist feels the most appropriate management so that deals with stable ischemic heart disease therefore this process of gradual narrowing and, and all that but heart attacks don't occur in that situation where the artery gets narrower and narrower and narrower and uh, it doesn't lead to when the artery blocks up it rarely causes a heart attack in that situation because it's gradual if the process is gradual then our bodies because we have three arteries the other two guys will say hey this poor guy is having trouble his area is not getting supply they will develop their own channels and somehow or other the body can do its own bypass work and it's called collateralization and that's why many people go for their annual checkup right they go to executive screening they do a checkup stress test this year pass next year they do another stress test they pass and the third year they go for the stress test and they fail and the next thing they know they're having an angiogram and then at the time of the angiogram the cardiologist says you know all of my all three arteries are blocked huh you need a bypass or you need multiple vessel angioplasty and the patient says, what? I mean, I've been coming every year for a checkup. You tell me everything is fine. How come this has happened? It's because the process is going on slowly. So the body does its own bypasses and helps, each helps itself out until the point where all three can't help each other because they're all diseased and then help. So, so the bottom line is stable disease is fine because yes, you may get to that point and you need a bypass. Yes, that's a good procedure that will make you well and safe but the problem is those plaques as they develop they may burst before they reach the point where they're, they're severe and like a pimple on the inside instead of a pimple on your face a pimple on the inside of the artery those pimples are made of cholesterol plaque those plaques like a pimple may burst prematurely and cause a blood clot to form and that's what causes sudden death so when we're, when we're talking about sudden death and people who've had heart attacks out of the blue it's usually due to pimple, a cholesterol pimple on the inner lining of the artery popping and causing a blood clot to form at the spot like a vol volcano uh, explosion and a, and, a, and a clot at the crater and that blocks the blood flow and that's what, if the position, location of that block is critical you will die on the spot so cholesterol is of course by um, um, originated, right? Because Again, you're wrong. No. Eighty no. percent of our cholesterol is made by our own liver, mm -hmm. and that's programmed genetically. Diet contributes twenty percent of our cholesterol. Twenty depends. I'm eating bakute every day or siu yolk and all these, uh, you know, uh, unhealthy mutton varuval and roti chana every day. Then of course. Maybe the proportion of cholesterol contributed by food may go up to 30 or 40 percent. But generally, the majority of the cholesterol is made by our own bodies. And that's why genetics come in again, hereditary disease comes in. Gosh, okay, so how can you dictate, how can you uh, intervene in that, that whole um, concoction? That's why I'm saying, when you hit 30, especially if you've got a family history, go and do a blood test, if your cholesterol is high, and you're already being a sensible guy. I mean, you eat your... I mean, you know, when people stop eating and become vegetarian and all that, we have as much heart disease in vegetarians as non-vegetarians. So food contributes, as I said, only 30 or 40 percent. So if your diet is particularly bad, then I'll tell the patient, hey, please, uh, go and eat a bit more sensibly. Don't become a vegetarian uh, for health reasons. Uh, don't stop eating this, 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 but just cut down drastically on super, you know, the processed foods, uh, you know, fast food, all that stuff, because it's pure trans fat, which is rich in LDL cholesterol, which is the key pimple forming agent. So a pimple of the artery is not face, uh, please, sir. Uh, but uh, um, yeah, so I say cut down all that and come back and you check your blood within two or three months, it'll probably make a minor dent. And if the LDL is still high, we have certain targets which we aim to achieve based on scientific research that, that if you achieve these targets, your risk of these events drops exponentially. So if in two or three months the guy comes back or the girl comes back and the cholesterol is still high, I say, okay, it's time to take a pill. One pill a day, a statin every day, any time of day, morning, noon or night, empty stomach, full stomach with, with coffee, with tea, with beer, with whatever your preference is. 
that tablet is going to reduce your risk of heart disease by 30 to 40 percent. So it makes, you make it sound as if a lot of your patients um, have pre-existing family hereditary issues, but what about those, no, so that's not the case. No. So for those who don't have uh, pre-existing family issues and they keep a healthy lifestyle, their chances of having a heart issue is very small, is that right? Yep. It's a bell-shaped curve. All right, you look at the population of people. There are people on the extreme side, on, on one extreme, who have very good genes. Their parents lived to their 90s, their father smoked 60 a day, every day, nothing happened to him. Mom smoked 40 a day, nothing happened to her. And they lived to 80 or 90. And those people who inherit those genes, they are laughing. So it's a pure lottery in that sense? Lottery on which parents you have, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then on the other extreme, there are these very smitten families who have a genetic element that predisposes them, and they can be health conscious as crazy, exercise, slim, do all the right things, meditate, don't need this, don't need that, no stress, and yet they, in the 30s and 40s, they all. I had families of people in their 40s, all heart attacks, stents, angioplasty, bypass. Then I have families where they eat everything, they smoke everything, they drink everything, and they come with a checkup and everything is perfect. These are the two extremes. Now, the majority of people lie in the middle bit. So if the whole nation, everybody was forced to eat certain foods and exercise every day, we had mass compulsory exercise and all that, then the health of the nation would shift slightly towards health. But on an individual basis, uh, you need to know whether you are either extreme and if you are not on either extreme then you probably can safely get by with basic lifestyle management and uh, diet and all those things. So in your opinion, what is the link between exercise and good health? Is it as huge as people suggest or not really? Not really. Exercise is good for I mean, the advantages of exercise are you lower your sugar. So if you are a borderline fringe potential diabetic, exercise will reduce that likelihood. If you have high blood pressure, exercise will reduce the likelihood of you developing hypertension or delay the onset of hypertension. Exercise has very little effect on cholesterol. So a lot of people say, Doctor, I don't want to take statin. Whoa, they say uh, I'll damage my liver, damage my kidney, and damage my brain, and damage all kinds of other things, right? But it's all nonsense, uh, okay? Um, and they say, I go and exercise, then come back. And I say, okay, let you satisfy. So they go away, three months of crazy exercise, they come back looking fantastic, but the cholesterol looks as bad as it ever was. So exercise does not make a dent on the LDL cholesterol, which is the killer. It does improve HDL. Now, you know, if you all have done, I'm sure most of you would know what the LDL and HDL. LDL is the bad cholesterol, the one that, that causes the plaques that rupture and cause blockages. And HDL is the, you know, Bandaraya thing that goes around cleaning the arteries and all that. So exercise improves the HDL. And so the belief is that, you know, if you have a good HDL, even though your cholesterol LDL might be a bit bad, maybe this one can count him the bad LDL and, you know, it might get by. Uh, so exercise does help with the HDL, but it does not help with LDL much. And um, there's this idea, this school of thought, that um, your heart has only got a certain number of beats in its lifespan. No, That's uh, BS, yeah. 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 So exercise is actually good for you? It's exercise is good because it, it works on every other parameter. Blood pressure, diabetes, um, uh, blood pressure, diabetes, weight. Uh, and come on, let, let, let's not forget, getting old is not just about avoiding heart disease. Keeping your core strength, so your mobility uh, prevents against falls. It reduces dementia. So exercise has got a lot of good things going for it. But specifically as a major heart disease uh, uh, protector, no, no. Um, and I would also go on to say that extreme exercise is possibly harmful. Um, the healthiest cardiovascular exercise, forget about looking good and looking gorgeous and being fat free and all that. If you're putting that all aside, you're talking about cardiovascular health, 150 minutes of uh, moderate aerobic exercise 
is all you need a week. 150 minutes, that's yeah. not long though. You don't need to do spinning, you don't need to hit the... All these target heart rates that people talk about, I've, I, you know, I have to achieve this, I haven't achieved this. So it's all so BS, so yeah, BS, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, so you don't have to go beyond a certain... No, level. no, absolutely not. In fact, extreme exercise, like people who love doing extreme cycling and cycling, you know, people who are so-called fit, I've seen so many sun deaths and all that in people who do extreme sport. Oh, okay. Yeah, triathlon, marathons, yeah. Um, is, is there, what is the link between your heart rate and heart health? So there's this idea that the lower your heart rate, the healthier you are, is that right? Well, it shows how well conditioned you are. Basically, the more you exercise, the more you train, the lower your heart rate gets, the more aerobic exercise you do. And it's just a reflection of your aerobic cardiovascular health. Runners, um, triathletes and all that, I have quite a lot of iron, iron lung, I mean, iron, iron, iron men and all that. Their heart rates are, you know, at best of time, 40 to 50. So they're supremely fit. But I've had these guys who've also got blocks in their heart. All right. And they've had and they have hypertension i've got uh, i've got one very well known uh, iron man yeah, iron man right that's what they call right triathlete. triathlete yeah he's got hypertension he's got hyperlipidemia he's got high cholesterol uh, and he's on pills wow despite that and he's super fit i don't bother putting him on the treadmill the machine will break down <laughs> yeah it's so He's got bad genes, sir. Um, and then this is, you know, when you have uh, one of those smart watches, right? It tells mm. you about heart rate variability and mm. the, the more variable your heart rate, you know, the healthier you are. Well, what do you think of that? What does it tell you? From a practical, medical, cardiological point of view, it's all nonsense, sir. Yeah. I think if you get into the realms of sports medicine and, and extreme fitness and, you know, like, these guys who are competing in, in cycling and uh, you know marathons, triathletes, and then there are finer points of science, which is sports medicine, where minor minor changes here there may improve your endurance or performance. We are not performance doctors. We are we are into just keeping you alive as long as possible and giving quality of life. So all these things don't have a bearing on general health. So I, we don't even, I, when patients come with their smartwatch and I just, oh my gosh, here we go. They're going to show out their printout and what their heart rate does. I said, oh, it all means nothing. Yeah. 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 So in essence, basically, uh, if you're born or lucky with a low genes, gene pool, then you have to watch out. Right? But it, then if you don't have that pre existing, then you just keep in good health, you're all right. Yes. It's as yes. simple as that. It's as simple as that. I mean, put it in a nutshell, yes. Of course, you know. Shit happens la, still, right? And uh, you get things left field flying at you. But I mean, you're driving a car and uh, you could get slammed by a truck and that's it, right? So the uh, rest of it is bad luck and chance and all those things. And, and also there's this idea that um, the COVID vaccinations, the, the linkage between that and the heart failures and all this, what, what do you make of that? They've looked into this extensively because the press have made a, a big deal out of it. And in fact, only last week there was a paper published. The third vaccine has the potential to cause 0 0.8 per 100,000 myocarditis. So, out of 100,000 people who have it, 0 0.8 have been shown to get a mild viral viral myocarditis, which is, remember what I was talking about, uh, inflammation of the heart muscle due to virus, 0 0.8 per 100,000 and affects people under 20. That's why there was a time where they said, you know, young adolescent males, males should avoid the third vaccine. But then none of these so-called afflicted numbers have ever have died. They've had a transient fever and they've had uh, breathlessness or palpitations, which is passed off after two or three weeks and they've all, nobody's died. So it's a complete, uh, um, uh, it's, there's no basis or solid data to back that. So how, how many years have you been a doctor already, a heart doctor? Heart doctors, 1990. 
30, before you were born. Uh, when ah, were you born? No, please, I wish. 1990, so that's like 34, 24 yeah, yeah, 34 years. What have you learned about the heart since then? What, what conclusions have you reached? I think what I've, the conclusion I've reached, it's a very um, complex but largely manageable organ in the body but because of its nature of its very sudden and unpredictable rare events that happen it keeps us always in a state of uncertainty there's always a little niggle at the back of our mind when you tell the patient all right you're going to be fine don't worry because these funny things rarely rarely happen yeah. you know they do happen and you know we've all lost uh, lots of cardiologists uh, friends of mine who are doctors have have lost people who have we've thought are completely going to be okay or safe it, it's there's an unpredictable nature to it that we can't legislate against 100 percent and people have this feeling that once they've seen a cardiologist they should be safe forever i mean it's of course, nothing is 100% proof. So, you need, you need a bit of intervention from above. And most importantly, I, I, there's any message that the lay public need to hear is that if you're told to take a drug, if you've been recommended to take a drug, do not listen to your, your cardiologist next door or the, the guy in the locker room in the golf club or your best friend in the pub at night. Because there's so much rubbish on social media that it's scary and there wasn't this uh, thing going around in, in the lay world uh, we really have I think our work volume be down to a third if everybody took the medication they need to be on long term uh, without listening to all the rubbish about side effects and all that somebody I've described do a checkup you don't have to go to a fancy hospital or anything get your bloods done and then if there's anything that's worrying there go and see a, sp a physician or a cardiologist and get them to advise you how to go from there uh, don't turn down the medicine take it if you're told to take medicine please take it as long as the doctor tells you to take it do not stop it do not listen to any other doctor who tells you to stop it do not substitute it with supplements or vitamins which have no clear proven benefit whatsoever. Uh, if you go to a pharmacy with a prescription, put on blinkers, go straight to the pharmacy counter, give the prescription, get your drugs and put, walk straight out. Don't be tempted to buy any of the stuff on the sides which is probably not going to work uh, and just break the bank for you. Yeah. Okay. And are there any... Um Categories of people, or gender, or, or race, or or, um, or even age, which might be predisposed to heart issues. I mean, the older you are, the higher the risk of heart disease, mainly because of wear and tear. And the longer the duration of your risk factors, the greater the toll they will take on your blood vessels. So, elderly, obviously, Indians are the highest risk race on the planet. And that's, um, yeah. Why is that? Genetic plus diet plus, I think, a whole milieu of stuff. Lah. But there's definitely a genetic predisposition. A higher incidence of insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is the big bad wolf that's going to eat up the world. Therefore, uh, fast foods, high carbohydrate, sugar intake, diabetes uh, is going to be the biggest source of problems for health services everywhere, especially cardiologists, because it is one of the major risk factors for heart disease. And so if you're an Indian in uh, Malaysia or even India or, or America, you have the same collect collective uh, genetic pool, right? so you've got to watch out for that. They are the highest risk population in, in USA, yeah. uh, South Asians, uh, as they describe South Asians there. Uh, uh, because of the higher incidence of insulin resistance, they tend to have slightly smaller blood vessels and they have um, very aggressive atherosclerosis. Okay. 
And what about the least uh, um, vulnerable? Uh, least vulnerable. I think I'd say like you know the Japanese. Well, the Japanese have a lot of heart disease because of the heavy smoking, right? Uh, I'm not actually aware of a race that's least vulnerable, or, but generally, I think uh, the Caucasians, uh, African Americans probably have a slightly lower incidence of coronary artery disease, but they have a lot of stroke because they have a lot of hypertension. But um, yeah, I think Chinese, again, if not for smoking, they, they tend to have a slightly lower risk of coronary artery disease. And is there a link between alcohol and heart health? Alcohol used to be mooted as something healthy for the heart. Uh, but currently, the data is a bit conflicting. But I'll certainly say that um, cigarette smoking is absolutely dangerous. I cause vaping, maybe to a slightly lesser extent, but all forms of smoking are dangerous. Alcohol in moderation, maybe one, five drinks, six drinks a week, spread out over a week, you know, whatever the drink. It doesn't have to be red wine, which is, you know, promoted vast, very aggressively by the French and Italians, but uh, uh, any form of alcohol in mild to moderate amounts is probably cardiovascularly good uh, and actually beneficial perhaps. But um, the problem is most people binge. They don't drink every day in the week and they drink one day that same amount in one night, which is dangerous. There's been an association of increased events with binge drinking uh, and certainly electrical problems with the heart with binge drinking. Okay. Any last remarks before we let you go? Anybody? Yeah, I mean, as I said earlier, to recap the same old thing, if you identify yourself as one of those people who are potentially at risk, you're 30, 30 years old, 30 plus, uh, you know, you might think you exercise and you look good and you're slim, but if you have any of these risk factors, get into a checkup and get the doctor to advise you and listen to what the doctor says. If he prescribes medication, take it. Take your drugs because that is the only thing that's going to beat your genes and beat your bad karma and beat all those things that you think you're unfortunate to get. But the drugs are there to save you. Take them. They're safe. Okay, brother. Thank you so much. Cheers, John.